<laughs> so I'm really happy to introduce Anya Wallace and Darius Carter, who are gonna be teaching our Black Era class for Cassandra Classrooms this upcoming semester. Um, and I just wanted to sort of be in conversation about the course and about their work, their upcoming projects, their past projects, and thoughts on some of the themes and um, content related to the course. Um, you want to start? Yeah, my name is Darius Carter. Um, I write and I am a bookmaker. Um, I make small art books. Um, I have a huge interest in Black archival materials. And so I'm trying to find ways to give those materials different kinds of life. And um, wrapping up um, a couple of projects I'm trying to. One is called Obscene Material, um, Black Girls Aesthetic Refusal in the Moen Scandal, where I'm writing about how Black girls survive the sexual advances of a Dutchman claiming to be an anthropologist so that he could um, access their bodies and assault them. Um, this happened 100 years ago in Washington, DC. So I write um, with and against historical documents related to the scandals. Um, I've got over a thousand pages of material with less than 10 that even claim to acknowledge the voices of black girls. And so I think and write and act and move and narrate from those less than 10 pages um, against the, that pile of a thousand plus um, and really try to advance a way of writing that is ethical, that doesn't try to say, this is exactly who these black girls um, are. Um, but it says, no, in the academy, we have academics haven't yet figured out a way to theorize Black girlhood. Um, there are scholars who are doing work in Black girlhood studies, but I think I'm pushing for another kind of discussion of Black girlhood, one that centers the moments where they leave rooms, they resist um, in advance. And I'm like, from these like so-called or allegedly minor moments, I'm like a whole style of narration emerges um, so I'm trying to wrap up that book now. Um, it's haunted me for a very long time, but it's also forced me to become the kind of writer that I want to be, which, um, which I like, uh, which I love. And I'm also working on um, a book called Black Girls in Archive. Um, Anya and I, Anya is one of the collaborators on that project. Um, Sharita Town and I have been building this project using FBI and documents from that scandal. We wanted to construct a book that literally required readers to take time and take care of the voices of Black girls. So um, we excerpted material from FBI records. Um, we found some of the photos that this Dutchman took and we cropped them so that you can only see the face. And we asked um, a handful of Black women poets to write poems um, based, well, poems from the perspective of Black girls. Um, and so Sharita and I have been, we've designed this 10 inch by 10 inch by 10 inch Black cube um, that's going to house each poem. Um, each poem has, um, it comes in a different form. One, for instance, written by Cheryl Clark is, um, comes in like a two inch by three inch metal tin. And when you open the tin, um, there is a sheet of red velvet paper um, that's been cut to the size of the tin. And on that sheet of paper is um, champagne colored satin ribbon. And so you have to uncoil um, the ribbon to read the poem, which is white text. And then you have to slowly wrap it back up around your finger so that it fits right into the tin. And so each piece requires that kind of attention. You know, you have to sit with it, look at it, get an idea of how to hold it, how to take care of it, and then how to place it back in that box. And the way that we have it arranged, you can either have the, the top portion on it, like the lid, or you can just have it open. So it's its own display piece. Um, those two projects are front and center in my mind. Um, and at some point, very soon, um, like in the next couple of weeks, I'll be turning my attention to um, a project, a short book with Bloomsbury on Marvin Gaye's album, I Want You. Um, oh. Yeah, it's part of a larger project that I'm doing called Black Revelry, which is in honor of Ernie Barnes's painting, The Sugar Shack. Um, and that has a radio show component, which is a Black Rubber Required Storm. Um, the last episode is this month. <laughs> um, it's just a three-part um, mini-series. And um, hopefully the next iteration will be a um, performance lecture. Um, it'll be a collaboration between myself, um, dancer and choreographer Jennifer Harge, and also Dwayne Holland, where we'll take details from Barnes's painting 
um, and pair that with these mini lectures that I provide on Black music history and theory and desire. Um, yeah, and then it'll end with the art publication in Amsterdam. Cool. cool. Thank you for having me and Darius, and it's been wonderful to meet you and be in conversation with you um, so far. I am an I'm a visual artist. I um, actually in undergrad studio art was one of my majors because I was supposed to I was supposed to do an architecture program. I was super obsessed and thought I was going to be an architect. My grandfather, I consider an architect, but he was a contractor in um, historic South Florida, the first black contractor. And so his, um, he built the family home that we lived in. And so like his kind of aesthetic and like crafting was very much a part of um, my family makeup, who I am, who I've become. So I, I thought I wanted to be an architect like him. And my school didn't have an architecture program, but they like lured me in with, oh, we have this um, dual program, dual degree program with Washington University and you'll major in studio art here and then you'll go there your junior year and you'll finish in architecture. Um, that didn't end up happening, but I was a studio art major and I graduated. And then went to graduate school once again, like, all right, I'm about to do this architecture thing for show now. <laughs> and I think I took like two semesters of architecture classes and I was like, I don't like this. Um, it was a little bit too technical for me. And I found my way over to the photography department and what I like to tell, the way that I like to tell the story is that like photography was a beautiful me um, mix, balance of the technical and the aesthetic that I think that I was craving from architecture. Because architecture itself, like classes, at least at the point I was at, was like build, learning building codes and just all kinds of tedious, not fun stuff so um I wanted to do the not not quite interior design but I wanted to like be a part of the artistic process of building buildings um so anyway I got into photography I loved it I love the technical aspects I love working with chemicals I loved being in the dark room for days at a time um measuring and you know your blacks your darks your lights oh my god this is so perfect for the conversation oh. your, <laughs> your grays I was obsessed with that um, precision that came along with uh, photography but also photography and um, what also becomes like a prominent part of the story is that my grandfather was a photographer and he took pictures like that. What he did in his free time was take pictures of his family. And so there's this whole process in a, our family of like pictures being like gold, treated like gold and archived and, you know, even picture, pictures being stolen as like this grave offense against um, the family or the person or, you know, so it's, it's still a thing. We're still doing it. It's happening in the virtual world now, but like, that's the, that's like the core of my artistry, like technical precision and art, artistic vision, um, black imagination, you know, a lot of the stuff you just talked about, I was, I just started this um, Catherine McKittrick essay on di di diachronic, diachronic loops, dead weight, tonage, and bad measure. Mm. Very interesting kind of like resonances in terms of like auto, auto poetics, like the measure, you know, using internal measures, using like kind of an interior there's a resonance of like internal, especially like internal domestic or, or social production, you know, kind of like discrete or in, um, intimate social production, I think is really interesting. Um, I want to read this. Yeah, no, I just started it, but but also, yeah, thinking about weights and measure, there's one section. Um, if the history Walden uncovers is one of public racial violence and the anticipation of different instances of post-slave premature death, we would do well to think through how the seeming scientific underpinnings of modernity acts that way and measure and differentiate are insinuated into and push up against the knowledge systems that narrate the Zong 
um, the zone. Mm. So it's about like measure. Yeah, we might dwell even more on the measure on the measurements that make this difficult diasporic life possible, in part because, as I also note, the practice of empirical containment provides the conditions for social theories to interrupt and undo and prop up the logic of race. I think about that a lot in terms of what you were talking about with techni technicality and the sort of technical precision versus like like your you know even your grand the definition of your grandfather as an architect versus being a contractor. I mm -hmm. think back to Esther Gates talks about the artist and the artisan. There's a racial aspect to that. Yeah, there's a racial, there's an aspect of blackness to that contractor versus architect when I'm putting it in my story. Um, I, I think it's beautiful what you just offered and I wanna take some time to, um, to ponder what that could mean to the story. But the reason why I differentiate is first of all, that's how it's told to me through the narrative, the oral, you know, from my family members. But he, at that time, for a black man, he, it's not that he couldn't have been an architect, but, you know, with the trajectory of his life and where he was in his family, he immigrated from the Bahamas, he came here on a fruit picking contract. Um, that was, the archi that was the architect that he could be at that at that moment. And we like honor that. We honor that as equally as we would if he had an architecture degree. And um, I just I don't I don't there's also a picture in my mind, a photograph in my mind. And my grandfather is um, maybe in his 40s and he's standing in front of his truck that he used for work. And on the truck, it reads R.G. Christie. His name was Raymond George Christie, general contractor, and then his license number. And he's like sexy ass pose leaning back on his truck. It's in front of our house. You can't quite see the house that he built. Um, but this picture is like the iconic picture of my family that someone even captured this moment and like that we have them. So like his, his business and his uh, title was under that name. So we gonna use it, but he was in fact an architect, you know? And ev even the story of the house. Um, so my, my mother is a twin and the twin twins uh, were his firstborn children, him and my grandmother's firstborn children. When they were born, they lived in an apartment until they were about three while he was building this house in what, it, what is now an historic area of um, Fort Lauderdale. And the house started off as one story and I think three bedrooms. And there's a part of the house where the kitchen used to be because eventually they have more children and then they expanded. So now the house is a two-story house. There's a Florida room in the back. It, um, it was eventually, it was at 1.7 bedrooms, but then more people from the family have done renovations. And, and so now it's five, but like, my mom and my mom used to say this, he drew plans and all kinds of stuff because at that time you didn't have the luxury, especially as a black man of also having an architect design your house. So like the architecture or the, the visionary part was just as much a part of his process as act, the actual labor of laying the bricks, working with other black men, working with Mr. Burroughs down the street who was an electrician. And my, you know, my mom can name off these different people like, oh, Mr. So-and-so did the painting for daddy or Mr. So-and-so um, helped lay the whatever when, he, when he, he was at that part. She can go throughout the city and point out houses and neighborhoods that he built um, one of the most beautiful homes in the neighborhood that I grew up in is Dr. Shirley's house that my grandfather built for him. And the legend is he never finished paying my grandpa, but it's um, like a circle. This house like is a circle. And Dr. Shirley did not design that house. R.G. Christie, general contractor, designed that house. Um, so yeah, that, that was a long way of saying absolutely. Um, and I, I want to embrace what you just offered and also 
like not leave behind that there was this tension, black, white tension um, around that, that term being used because it was, I think the house was first built in 1953. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, that's, yeah, there's so much there. Circular houses, so that sounds so cool too. I'd love to see some of the drawings from that. That sounds amazing. I need to yeah. take some pictures of these places before I leave, but it's it's a prize of the neighborhood still. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking back through kind of. I also studied architecture for a year at Cooper, and I'm just kind of thinking. <gasps> yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of like, um, I mean, I guess kind of also studying a lot of the famous white modernist architects, right? There's like. Mm -hmm. there's, they have a kind of like a genius fetish that becomes this like I equate genius and genocide you know like control yes over yes inverse of what you're talking about where it's this generative kind of like pride of a neighborhood and a space and developing a space with a community of people it becomes like how much marble I can quarry how much concrete we can mass how we can cast concrete how we can you know like these these things that require also systems colonial systems of labor that like um, you know, just, and then their, their legacies become like the amalgamation of certain resources and certain discourses and like Paul Williams and like the few kind of practicing black architects and how, you know, visionary and like very, I mean, Paul Williams designed some beautiful homes in LA, you know, like, I don't, just thinking about that, that way of taking up kind of like architectural discourse as well, you know, like within the community. Yeah. It's interesting. It's really interesting. But yeah, some of the, especially the importance of drafting and that kind of like technical labor on top of a creative process. And I'm thinking a lot too right now about cultural property, intellectual property, and how, um, you know, how difficult those intersections have been for Black people where we get, you know, con kind of like condensed and, and flattened into like a style, a line, a theory, or an idea, you know, instead of having like kind of domains of individual authorship and really being subjected to extreme technical scrutiny, um, you know, while being like very much erased as creative sources or sources of authorship. Yeah, you know, one of the things that comes up for me um, is earlier conversations that Anya and I had on um, the kind of comments that we would receive um, when you know, folks who are looking at our work will just won't identify specific folks. But, you know, when you get feedback on work and instead of engaging the ideas, folks will default to punctuation, to all of these very technical things which are meant to help you um, make your ideas more concise when it's like, no, we wander and we meander. But there is a wrangling of our thought and our thought process um, on the page such that what it is that we're communicating is more palatable um, to the reader. And at various points, we've taken great issue with that because we're like, well, you're trying to make our form adhere to a logic that is antithetical to our personhood, right? So I'm gonna sit here and agonize over punctuation when you're missing the very fact, or you are at some register very attuned to what it is that I'm trying to advance, but you refuse to acknowledge it at the level of um, recognition or open recognition, right? And so, you know, for us, like the, the drafts become um, this space where so much of the thought process resides and so much of the work is done. And the finished product is simply one iteration of an endurance performance of an idea, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm, I'm very much of the mind, it's like, give an idea, give a project, different iterations. Think of it in terms of constellations, suites, plot points, like let it regenerate, let it operate differently, let it move you, let it inhabit you, and do something otherwise with it. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, well, definitely. At the end, um, maybe yeah. Could you talk a little bit more? To I mean, palatability. Is, wow, really took me to a couple places. Um, mm -hmm. it's like this, this whole you know kind of cannibalism and fetishism, mm -hmm. kind of you know again this kind of like modernist dominance. Palatability, I think, is a really interesting kind of form of also this cultural flattening that we're talking about, like. Mm. The objective, the line, the point, the plane, 
Yeah, it reminds me quite a bit of um, the some of the work that Sylvia Winter's done on aesthetics, right? And you know, uh, establishing palettes that are then determined as refined, right? Like hollow don't mean shit. <laughs> um, like it does a particular kind of work, but it don't mean shit, objectively speaking, right? Um, but there are ways that we're cultivated to have these palettes, right? Um, across media, across context, that then becomes also a discourse of authorization. It's like, well, are we going to take this seriously, right? Generally, it's not, right? <laughs> Generally, folks are like, no, we're not going to take it seriously because it doesn't adhere to, say, these genre conventions, or it doesn't adhere to the aesthetic qualities that we hope or wish to privilege, right, and perpetuate. But also, like, you know, one of the discussions we had early on was Black women historically innovating, right, um, in terms of form and idea in theory, but having those innovations be cast to the side, mm -hmm. right? Say for one that every few years or so can like bubble up to the surface, but it's like for every one, there's at least dozens, right? <laughs> Easily dozens, not hundreds or thousands whose work has been dismissed because it didn't adhere to like pre-prescribed logics, right? And so that too is a part of the, the taste making, right? It's the, that's a part of the refinement of the palette. And so we are um, making space for that kind of work to live so that it doesn't simply gain credibility or traction when it's authorized by in like the dominant register. Like this shit don't matter all the time. Like, there's I so feel many like mm -hmm. I want to do what I want to do. Yep. I'm an artist and Darius and I, we talk about this all the time. I like writing on paper. I like the way my handwriting looks. I went to Catholic school for 13 years and the nuns made sure that I knew how to write. And then I remember the process of like rebelling and, you know, doing certain letters my own way and shit. Other people did too, but like then what ends up sticking as a part of your like handwriting. It, it saddens me that the kids don't get handwriting and, um, a lot of people's handwriting <laughs> for your birthday cake, Darius. A lot of handwriting that I've seen is so um, not even elementary, just like um, it seems uh, stunted, yeah. stunted. And um, I, I like to write and I like the process of drafting because it's so artistic to me. And if you're reading my work, if you're interested in reading my work, if you're interested in judging my work, I would like you to be a part of that process. Like, look at this page of notes I just took. It is so cute. <laughs> um, should we take a picture of this or whatever? Like, there's a hoarding part of me, too, that's like, don't throw that away. That's cute. I mean, I know there's going to be, like, other iterations of the editing whatever but no just leave it leave it <laughs> you know and I think that there's a fear around that there's a um anxiety I think people have felt intimidated people have felt straight up scared and then you get defensive and mean so it's like well how can I you know, cut this, cut you back down to size to make you know that you don't know everything or whatever. But like, you can't argue with me over what I saw. I imagined this is what I did. Yeah, no, we could talk about what you did also, but let's talk about the thing or I don't need you. I mean, I'm just, it just brought me to like recognition, this idea of recognition and um, even thinking about two things like one is graffiti there's like we, we you know we, we just did a project in Pompeii looking at, at graffiti and like kind of left like um, residual graffiti from pre-Roman cultures actually there and then just this rich like history of like kind of interacting with electoral candidacy signs via graffiti that I think well, that kind of mark making as a means of like mission of of you know, the political class or it's like a social site of the political class, a record of the political class, of like the, you know, the non-citizen class, especially. And even those personal moments of like, you know, like, um, yeah, I don't know, just love letters and, you know, missing notes and 
slurs and, you know, like just seeing that, you know, 4,000 years of old of that kind of like intervention really also brings home the importance of mark making where even some graffiti is preserved because it is so clever or, mm -hmm. you know, like, I don't know, it's a really interesting thing. And then I think about that hoarding too, with these practices like pipers and, you know, really also that kind of that hoarding is supposed to be like a coping mechanism for loss. So thinking also too about like kind of the loss of mm -hmm. intellectual property, like we were talking about, you know, the obvious loss of intellectual property that happens from appropriation and, and that flattening, but the financial losses and stuff mm -hmm. and coping, you know, even an imaginary type of recuperation or, you know, amassing, even like you're saying, like my notes are cute, <laughs> you know, like let's get them in different formats. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, mm -hmm. Conversations, you know, and that that I think is a very um, maybe y'all can talk about it, but that almost feels like a counterintuitive place to be for a black mark maker, you know. We're mm -hmm. so expected to give away our lines, to not mm -hmm. hoard, you know, not hoard our, our 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 thoughts, even you know, like, um, and for our almost for our mark to be like even our mark in its illegibility has so carries caricature, you know, that kind of social recognition and caricature. Maybe y'all could talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Damn. Yeah. That's um that's fantastic. I I I think a lot about um black privacy. Um when I when I teach, I'm constantly reminding my students, especially the ones that come into the classroom, um, well intentioned in believing that, you know, they come in on behalf to speak on behalf of various communities. I'm like, well, first. Um, read this piece, The Race for Theory by Barbara Christian. I was like, you know, artists and communities don't necessarily need you in here as an interpreter. Um, you could do a different kind of work and I'm trying to help y'all create a space to think differently around your presence here. Um, but also to think very critically about what you don't need to offer up to the, to the academy specifically. Mm -hmm. I'm like, mm -hmm. there's so many ideas that you have. There's so many ways that you could like, you know, take a text by a theorist and mark it up. I encourage my students to annotate, um, cross out words, rethink shit, like reposition arguments, like re like actively make this piece yours, right? That doesn't mean that you have to make your process available, right? That doesn't mean that you have to make it do work for somebody else. This is for you. This is so you can carry your own shit through. And so it's okay to center your practice. It's for me necessary. <laughs> like mm -hmm. you will have this shit center your practice and not in a way that requires you to explain it. Like mm -hmm. you don't do this so you can make yourself more available in your labor and your body more available for others. You do this to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. So For me, marking is such a critical part of that project because I'm like, if we're talking about Audre Lorde's uses of the erotic or if we're talking about hell, Lamanda Stallings, there, there are all these black thinkers who I'm like, Yes, we can show up in a classroom and debate the ideas and like work through case studies, but also how are you, how are you preserving yourself? How are you remaking yourself? Mm -hmm. How are you building a grammar, not simply of your suffering, but also your thriving, right? How do you like hold your own imagination? Right. Where and how? Sometimes it's journaling, other times it is visual art, right? Sometimes it's like, I'm gonna make this bomb ass playlist. Other times it's like, I'm gonna write a love letter to myself, right? So there are all of these ways. Sometimes it's like ritual. I'm gonna sit and I'm gonna do a reading, right? Mm -hmm. Just to ground mm -hmm. myself and still myself. And there are some venues in which I will talk through that process with folks, but I'm not gonna show up to my nine to five time by, hey y'all. Here's how you're going to root yourself as Black subjects in this, like, <laughs> you know, variously hostile space to push through. We're not doing that work. And so, like, yeah. I think that the white academy, the Eurocentric academy, mm -hmm. wants the, 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 the key, like the map key. And I wasn't trying to give it up. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not making you no key for my work right. I'll make you think that I'm making you a key mm -hmm. because I I always want to bring up like this is how this is another way that you make yourself legible is you bring up these white folks so let's bring up D&G right mm -hmm. Deleuze and Guattari I sat in study group after study group like, studying their shit 
Like we got a we we over coffee and Turkish tea at night with all these like obnoxious ass white men just thinking they're doing something, trying to decipher this shit. Meanwhile, like gangbusters, my head's immediately translating it into black girlhood pleasure because that's what I write about. And when I got ready to write, I was like, oh, if y'all could spend all that time studying their shit, their broken sentences and drafts, because that's really what it is, then I could write like that too. Citation. I'm going to cite them. I'm doing what they're doing. (laughs) Figure it out. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Figure it out after I'm dead. I mean, I think you just have, you just touched on something like around citation. I wonder about like, um, how black practices of creation require um, citational innovation. Mm-hmm. Emily ain't got a guide, right? Mm-hmm. There's not a Turabian style for like citing nigga shit. There's mm-hmm. like, so we've got like footnotes so we can play in, but it's at times like knowledge production, expression, criticism, like requires various forms. And like, you know, Anya, one of the things that I appreciate about um, the writing, your writing specifically, is that it makes me want to think through more citational practices. Mm. Because it's like, love to do it in conversation, but I wonder like how it could look on a page, right? Mm -hmm. Like a watermark for me could be a citation, Mm -hmm. right? Like, can you imagine having one? And it is. Right? Like it's- And it is in my shit. Right? Like it's all of that right there, right? Mm -hmm. So it's for, for me writing, well, creative work, is an invitation it can be an invitation it's not always Mm. but i'm particularly excited as a reader and as a viewer when i get to approach a work and i feel invited to it right um i feel broken open i feel like that's a hole that i've fallen into Mm -hmm. and i'm like cool i'm just gonna wait here for a while Mm -hmm. and i don't know if i'm gonna make it out on the other side i don't know if there is another side but this space i'm just gonna be in it Mm. Yeah, I think that's my goal in writing. I want you to read every word. Like I want you to experience every word. And that is a part of my performance practice when I'm letting words hit the page or the screen. I know I don't like to read. When people make them long posts on Facebook or... um, (laughs) you know, whatever, six books you had to read for next week's global feminism class. Like, I hate reading. And we're trying our best to like figure out a way to skim it and just get the point. You know what I mean? Memes provide that for us now quite a bit. Like we're used to reading in these like snidbit, tidbit type ways. Um, I think we do the same thing when we read actual text or these journal articles or shit. Like this shit's boring. But I'm over here like, let me figure out how to mm. go the other way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I act, I do want you to read. When, when I take the time to write and it, I say it's done or I say ready to share or send or whatever, I want you to read everything that I wrote. Mm. So that desire is going into not only my writing, but also my citational practice. And the way that I I was never like traditionally trained in poetry. I mean, I've taken a few poetry classes here and there or whatever. All of these citational things like, yeah, you've used them. MLA, I think was more of the high school thing. Um, In art education, we use APA. I've try Chicago and stuff so like yeah I've used them I'm not completely just up here like oh I don't want to do that because um I never I don't know how and it scares me but the whole point of it and different styles of writing poetry from haiku to whatever is to not only get your reader to read but to experience what you're needing them to experience. You need them to pause. You need them to know that you weren't the first person that said this, somebody else did, or you want them to know that there's more to this idea, but that doesn't really go with where I'm trying to go right now. So I just do it. I just do that. And I, as if I'm painting a painting, 
I make that a part of my process. I don't have the months to spend on memorizing the APA book manual. And I have six of them. After a while, that's getting in the way of my process of trying to make markings based upon what I'm imagining and seeing that's happening very quickly and fleeting and all this stuff and to get you to read it and to experience it with me. Let an editor do that. Let a copy editor do that way down the line. And I don't want that job. So yes, I'll pay you for that. Mm -hmm. But don't hold me up when I'm trying to make art with that. You know, it's really interesting too. I've been thinking so much about, um, you know, the economic effects of, of the deprivation basically of like having intellectual property and like kind of codified intellectual property, which is like, what I'm kind of learning is essentially a spoil of war, you know, and a spoil of conquest um, and really, really deviated by military review, like mm. deviated by military review. So like, if we look at like things like the Lieber code from like, um, from like, like develops out of like the Emancipation Proclamation that deals with like, um, you know, what kind of like cultural property slaves own or what cultural property enslaved people were responsible for. There's like, I mean, I'm just gonna read some of this part of a uh, KJ Green intellectual property at the intersection of race and gender, Lady Sings the Blues. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of about the, um, it's, it's now critical race theory, so a kind of law theory. Um, and they say insight that, that critical race theory offers to IP law is that its use in society and legal scholarship like anti-discrimination law also may serve to entrench material forms of discrimination. So while individual black artists without question have benefited from the IP system, the economic effect of IP deprivation on the black community have been devastating. Intellectual property today is perhaps the preeminent business asset. Analysts recognize that black and other minorities in a market, in a market economy cannot participate as equals unless they too can deploy the private power Power generated by ownership and control substantial business assets. So thinking about how we like also, you know, kind of use citation, I think to, I mean, for me, it's like, there is nothing without citation. Cause like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm in a white cube alone. If it's not, if I'm not citing, you know what I mean? Citing. Mm -hmm. the, so also thinking about, you know, especially expanding the terms of cultural property so that they can be individually authored and asserted as culturally, you know, kind of in like collectively authored is something that, like IP is not not at all set up to to do, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. devastating to practices, um, you know, music practices, oral traditions, like, you know, everything that escapes the technical register, essentially, or mm -hmm. that, you know, stays in even the margin. Mm -hmm. The technical register, yeah. Yeah, and they, they, you know, copyright laws tend to not protect, you know, creative, um, the creative, I mean, that's that artisan artist, or artisan, yeah, artist, you know, like. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I, I want to, part of me wants to connect what you're saying to the improvisational, the question about the improvisational, because um, I do a lot of pop culture theory also in my work, and so I'm thinking of like rap and um, the rap world or like um, the way that riffing happens similarly to something like jazz but like you know um, that's the first place that, place that my brain went when you said improvisation earlier and then now when you just said you know there's there's really nothing without citation like yeah like we know black people black folk know citation real well real well and there's a way to, I, I think I'm a believer of the, there's no original thought school. Mm -hmm. So instead of being mad that I didn't get to say it first or mark it first, my job as an artist is to do what I do with it because only I can do what I can do. Only Darius can do what he can do with that thing. And that is the like good, that's the good rap. That's the good jazz. That's the good moments of improvisation when you know how to like give people their shine, their nod, and also like um, flatter. Like I could do it too, but I'm gonna do it this way. 
I'm going to do what Anya's way. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, it's so important too, I think. Yeah, as a form of as a form of social recognition, also thinking too about dance and, and song and, and black speech, even too how we recognize, you know, recognize each other outside of so many mm -hmm. contexts that wouldn't recognize <clears throat> that wouldn't recognize us. I think that citation is such a an affective thing, like an affective thing, such an emotional Yeah, affective. Yeah. So emotional. I mean, I'm even just thinking about Black TikTok a little bit too, and just how much, you know, even just being credited, you know, and also <laughs> other thing like the Library of Congress, I guess the Alan Lomax um, collection has had a system of repatriation of blues uh, musicians, but it's, it's, it's not economic repatriation. It's literally like they'll just figure out who actually sang the song in the recording and credit. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes not even really do a great job of letting descendants know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so there's a lot of that kind of citation too that's just, you know, thinking about personality rights and cultural property too, the honor and integrity of the artist being represented, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. being held first or something or in, a, in esteem. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, not to think about, but I wonder about or I'm really excited about the books and projects that never hit the main stage for different artists. Like at one point a few years ago, I was reading um, Kevin Young. This is the great album. Um, he like talks about shadow books and shit like that. And I'm like, mm. there's, we've always got stuff that we keep close, right? Or we've got ideas that don't take the way that we, you know, initially thought they would. And most recently, I just can't stop thinking about um, Zora Neale Hurston's vision of a uh, cemetery for the illustrious Negro dead. And I'm like her writing this letter to Du Bois in 1945, asking for his assistance with the creation of like this hundred acre spread in Florida. I'm like her vision of it is so gorgeous because she wants um, a physical location so that all of these remains can be placed there. She wants remains taken from other cemeteries and then placed there. She wants a small space that can serve as a writing retreat space for black artists. She wants it designed by sculptors and painters in the whole nine. And it's gotta be a hundred, it's gotta be a hundred acres because it's still Florida, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to see who's coming, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, like the moment I read it, I was like, oh, this exists. You know, it does, it's not a physical location in Florida, but she dreamt it up and it exists as it exists in textual form because of how she rendered it. She thought about plants that were mm -hmm. going to be there. Like she envisioned an entire ecosystem of black creative thriving and honoring. And I'm like, yeah, that shit exists. And I'm gonna continue to cite it. Like it's an active place. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, when I, when I cite Morrison in the classroom, I use the present tense. Mm -hmm. Like all it, like it's a, to me, there's a way that we hold information, we hold histories, we hold stories that defies the logics of time, order, place, all of that, mm -hmm. right? And so it's, yeah, you know, we, we make it, <laughs> we make it do so much more than anybody who thinks through a technical lens could possibly implement or imagine. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to end there, actually. That's so great. Ani, did you want to add anything about any projects, current, upcoming? Um, I um, am still trying to figure out my way in this academic world, um, which is actually great. It's been a great process for me. I, I just finished school in 2019 and got all of the craziness of getting my um, dissertation signed off on. So... Um, I took a bit of a break, though art, the art making never stops. And then um, this fall, I began teaching with the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. And um, it's just on a part-time basis right now. Um, and I add that because I think this is a part of my process of like uh, making myself right now into the kind of in, into the way that I want to participate in this world and then you know some traumas and things have also happened that remind me I don't want to just do it where I give over all of myself and my labor without um having any say so so um I I and I'm enjoying I'm enjoying the process of figuring out so I'm teaching with SAIC I taught a course called Black Visibility last semester 
so I said Darius came and was a part of my uh, class. We had a roundtable with Dr. Ruth Nicole Brown on um, blackness and the visibility of marking, reckless theatrics and all that good stuff. Um, this semester, I'm teaching uh, carceral studies, which it took me the whole of the break to get myself together to spend 16 weeks talking about incarceration with um, a predominantly white class, but we're in it and we're going to do it and we're going to, this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now, right? And I'm going to give it my all and I'm going to give it my artistic, you know, heart as well. Um, I have just been asked to do a talk with um, Mount Holyoke uh, with Sarah Stefana Smith, who's also an artist, is teaching a class on Black sexual economies. And um, I have a piece in that book with Dr. Jillian Hernandez, um, really curating the work and the writing of some of the girls that we worked with in Miami. And um, Sarah has is mapping her course around the chapters, the sections in the Black sexual economies um, anthology. So what she's asked me to do is to speak and try to connect the carceral aspect, which really I have a chapter in my dissertation on um, having worked with girls in juvenile detention um, and what I consider the Black female body bureaucracy. So the relationship between Black bodies, period, guards, girls, myself as a um, program facilitator, the preacher that comes on Monday nights to talk to them, all of those interactions of Black femme bodies and like what, what, that, what the economy of that is. Um, so I'll be, I'll be figuring out a way to connect um, those things for the Mount Holyoke talk in April. I'm doing Black Error with Cassandra Press and I'm excited to continue to like see this thing take, take shape with Darius. Um, this has been a great conversation and it also reminds me of a lot of the conversations he and I have had already. So it's just, it's nice to kind of see it shaping up and filling out. And I'm here with my family, trying to spend a couple months and get loved up on and get, get in fights with people and all that <laughs> stuff. But I'll be going back to Pennsylvania in the next week or so um, where my studio practices. And I have a beautiful studio that I love to work from to lay some things down. I look forward to seeing all of it. I'm super looking forward to y'all class. Yeah, this was great. So Black Air is going to start sometime in the first week of March. I'm super excited to see where you take the course and to see the you know, reactions of the students with everything. Really happy to have another join in the classroom team. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Yeah, seriously. And thank you again for being a part of this.